I'm going to introduce our guest to you. After I um, would like to acknowledge that the place where the clay studio stands and where I sit today is part of the traditional land of the Lenni Lenape. We acknowledge the Lenni Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. In our acknowledgement, in our acknowledgement of the continued presence of Lenape people in their homeland, we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief Tamanand, that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. Just to say again, we are recording and we are going to be posting the recording on our public YouTube channel. Thank you to Elizabeth for being here today. Elizabeth Agro is the Nancy M. McNeil Curator of American Modern and Contemporary Crafts and Decorative Arts at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Elizabeth, a museum curator and historian, embraces authenticity and pragmatism while bringing humanity into her discipline. She works collaboratively with colleagues and artists to advance an international view of contemporary decorative arts. Her curatorial practice privileges empathetic scholarship examining cultural, sociopolitical, and economic contexts foster a deeper understanding of contemporary art and the lived experience it captures. As a co-founder of Critical Craft Forum, Elizabeth is committed to crafts inclusion in the ever-changing global landscape of contemporary art and rethinking crafts past as well as documenting shifts in its relationship to nomenclature, classifications, marketplace, and presentation of the museum's collection. Her current projects include New Grit, Art and Philly Now, a cross-departmental installation to inaugurate the museum's new contemporary art galleries, co-curating a major exhibition examining ruptured time in contemporary Korean art and contributing to the four volume catalog of the PMA's American Silver Catalog, which I have one of the volumes of behind me. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, personally, very happy for Elizabeth to join us today when Elizabeth came to the museum and joined the American Art Department um, I knew I had immediately found a friend and mentor. She um, in, invited me to work with her on a project that we might talk a bit about later that really um, was very um, foundational for my practice. And I just also have to tell you that I had a very important role in her birthday when she first arrived at the museum and that was to greet Elmo at the door. Her parents and her sister <laughs> sent a person dressed like Elmo for her birthday and I had to walk downstairs <laughs> and get him at the door and then walk through the museum and said hi Anne to Anne Darnancourt as I walked by with Elmo going upstairs. Um, <laughs> so these are important historical facts that everyone should know. And I also want to acknowledge that we're talking about New Grit um, a little bit later in we have Kukuli Velarde here, who's one of our guests, and she's a major part of that exhibition. So thanks, Kukuli, for joining us. Elizabeth. Jennifer. <laughs> what? I didn't, I didn't think you'd go there with Elmo. <laughs> I, know, I mean, I had to go there with Elmo. It's a good story. You, you're not, you've totally un, unseated my friend. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Sorry. I should have warned you. I wrote okay. Elmo on my notebook. Um, so I'm going to start as I usually do with the question, how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? And that is a, a very important question. And um, I know we spoke about it the other day and I would say, I, having woken up this morning, I, I reframe, I'm going to reframe my answer that I gave you yesterday. I think it's important to say that, you know, although, um, you know, I, I come from uh, an Italian American background, a middle class home, my parents were, were school teachers. Um, and, you know, they, they like every consumer, you know, uh, def definitely participated in what was popular in different periods of time. And my mom went through a blue and white Asian phase, you know, every parent had, has their thing. But I think the most important foundational, there were two sort of elemental aspects of my upbringing. One, was my parents' um, insistence that we go to the museums in Manhattan. I lived on, uh, grew up on Long Island. So getting on the Long Island Railroad and, and going in to see King Tut, Peruvian gold, uh, experiencing the Whitney. I remember the, the summer that the Calder Circus, Circus was at the Whitney. 
and how important that was, that moment was for me, for some reason. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, so that was critical. My parents loved art. My father loved art. He fashioned himself as a illustrator and he liked to paint, um, and, uh, but not like formally. There was no canvases in my home or anything like that. Um, my aunts and uncles were all extremely talented and they were all in the fashion industry. Who was a sample maker, a pattern maker, um, my aunt Rose loved to um, do those tapestries and they were all images of 18th century famous paintings. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have any of these things in my home. I don't necessarily want to be surrounded by Fragonard and, and Boucher. It's not my style, not my period, but those images and her and her handwork. And I had a talent for handwork myself. Um, she taught me how to sew. I kind of skipped my mom. And so I learned how to sew at a very young age and I would pick up things and with buttons and rip pieces of fabric and make things. I took sewing in high school and made my pajamas and made a blazer. And, you know, so those things were very important. Um, and I would say the, the one of my mom's siblings who was the wealthiest of, of the nine uh, would travel to Asia and he'd bring back things. So I remember seeing those things in their home and um, their, their taste and, and then offset by my Aunt Charlotte on my father's side, who had the most the strangest dining room set of, of all my relatives. And it was mid-century modern. Um, it was Haywood Wakefield, of which I, I now, it was bequeathed to me. So that set has always been in my mind. My aunt knew as a little girl, I would stroke the, the uh, uh, buffet, you know, like I, something about that. It was just, and the, the way that the chairs were boomerang, you know, like loved it, loved it. So I would say that, was an early influence. And then um, as I, um, when I went to college and uh, decided upon art history, uh, specifically Italian studies to look at the Renaissance through varied lenses. So that explains my, I didn't know what that was called empathetic scholarship. That was not what it was called back then. It was just interdisciplinary. Um, and so I took a class with uh, Joseph Debella, who was a watercolorist uh, who taught us about gallery, it's called gallery, um, I forget the, the formal name of the class, but basically we ran the campus gallery and we put on three exhibitions. And it was that, that was a seminal moment. And I knew I wanted to work in the gallery scene. So I graduated and tried to get a job in Soho in the, the late eighties. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time I thought, well, that wasn't happening. It was very hard to get a job that summer. Um, and I decided, oh, I'll, I'll take this job at the Pierpont Morgan Library, <laughs> like as if it was a secondary prize. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, that was a seminal moment. I mean, that, that experience, although very, very, very low on the totem pole, um, opening mail for the entire institution. I mean, nothing was beneath me because I was the bottom. <laughs> That's so, how you um, learn about the institution, though. I mean, oh, my God. I, not only did I learn what how I did. The, the institution worked, but anyone who was deceased who got mail and went and got a gallery opening invitation, that was my meal ticket for the summer. Like I, I used it well. <laughs> I was a starving Whoa, what an admission. student. I mean, <laughs> Dead people's you know, mail. It's amazing what wine and cheese, how one can live on wine and cheese. You know, I mean, come on, people, we've all done this. <laughs> that and like, you know, feigning and you look gaunt at the makeup counter, you know, to be able to freshen up between whatever. We, you have to have tricks, people. You have to have tricks. <laughs> Up your sleeve. So um, anyway, it was survival, survival of the fittest. But I would say those were the two um, most seminal moments. And, and um, yeah, I would say those three things, definitely. Yeah. Well, and then you did, I know I'm always cheating because I've talked to everybody before, but <laughs> you went to Rome right. um, and you were surrounded by art and Italian culture and you had already chosen that Italian culture was something um, that you were interested in. I think that as over the years we've talked about the importance of food and dress and decorative arts kind of all mixed together and I think that goes back to your idea of that that's like the true meaning of empathetic curating is that you you're trying to you're trying to empathize with the users and the makers from the past that you can understand um, and really contemporary currently it's really too. about it's about context 
you know, it's it's not just about understanding what the artist was thinking. Those things are important. I'm not. Um, well, how they lived, what you know, what was important. How they lived. And, what were the times they lived in? What were the inf what was going on? They don't. They, you know, as anyone who works with living artists or even deceased artists, you can't just look at them and and seemingly, you know, and monolithically understand that they just made. They are not under a rock. They are influenced by all sorts of forces: economic, <laughs> political, social. Um, uh, trends, any anything. Well, you know, and the importance and, of that is to show that it's we're all connected. So oh, they were connected yeah, to those critically. in their own time. We're connected across time to them, yeah. um, and it really it's that understanding of the shared humanity between us all that I, I it really gets to the core of. Right. No. No. Truly, and and I think that time in Rome, I I studied through the Temple Rome program, and so even though I went to a college not that wasn't Temple Tyler. Um, I was able to get into their program and spend a semester. And that was the most amazing semester of my, six months of my life. I could be anything I wanted to be, any day I wanted to be. And to have people challenge you to sort of really look, real, like you had to make a best friend with a work of art in the Sistine Chapel or, or somewhere in Rome. And I chose one of the frescoes um, in the Sistine Chapel, not the, but one of the surrounding ones. And to not know anything and keep looking and keep looking and writing about it. And then you are allowed to research and like to confirm what it is you saw versus what has been critically written about it. What an exercise, like that, that was just formational. Um, I, I felt like it really trained my eye. And I always feel that, um, although maybe some might disagree, I feel like my eye has never let me wrong. Um, and so that was an important moment. And also as an Italian American, that was a, a, an important moment for me personally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that idea of making friend, best friends with the artwork and then doing the research later. And now I want to, you know, go do that. I want to do yeah, some let's exercises. Go do that. Away. Let's do it again. <laughs> um, so we were talked about the fact that there's this journey that you start out thinking you're going to do something, whether you're an artist or a curator or probably really any human, you know, you start out life thinking you're going to do one thing and then it evolves. So do you want to talk a little bit about what you, this, you started out thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to study Italian Renaissance glass ish, you know, and that's, a, and then how did that change and how well, did that I evolve? Think, I think anyone who's in graduate school, and I'm not talking about a PhD program, I'm talking about getting a master's degree. You're there to learn how to learn. You're mm -hmm. not there to learn everything there is to know. I mean, you try to accomplish that goal of learning everything that you, you know, in terms of your major, your minor and your unrelated minor, in the case of my experience, I, I was uh, an Italian, 16th century Italian uh, metal work major, 16th century Italian glass minor and a 17th century Engli English ceramics unrelated minor. And I related all those things to dining and banqueting. So it related back to the thing I love most, food. No surprise, anyone who knows me knows this. Um, I could tell you about the history of the fork, we, I'll spare you. You can invite me back for that one. Um, okay. Love that. You know, love that whole uh, experience. But what it taught me, what it taught me how to get out my Ouija board and talk to artists that were long, long dead. It taught me how to read, you know, uh, crazy uh, calligraphic, you know, handwritings of 16th century, 17th century writing when you're looking at primary source material. But it, it taught me how to think and it taught me how to write. Um, at least foundationally how to write. I mean, that takes practice like any good potter on a wheel. Writing is a long and arduous journey in itself in terms of learning that skill. Um, maybe some are born with it, but I think most of us are not. And, no, and if you think I, you have it, you still have work to do. Yeah, no. And I think it taught me, I mean, although I, I mean, again, those who know me, I, I can chat you up at any dinner conversation, but it also taught me how to present and work ideas um, sometimes I'm successful and sometimes, again, this is another craft skill that has to be honed, right? And so, um, so I would say graduate school, you know, I, I loved all those things. Did I think I was going to unseat Olga Raggio at the Met? Yeah, I had hoped, but that was not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And I had to, having gone into graduate school with five years working experience under my belt, which was unusual. I was an old lady compared to the kids that had just come out of undergrad who had started. So, you know, I, not that I seemed old, but you know, like in comparison, I wasn't green. 
I had worked in the museum world for many years. I had made connections and I understood how the museum world worked. And I also knew the likelihood of getting a job in New York was gonna be quite slim. So I knew that I had to take every intro class I could and be as expansive as I could and marry my, wor my work experience with, with the fact that I had a degree and I knew how to do this work. And by putting those two things together, adding on a level about technology, which was budding at that point in museum work, or at least finally being accepted by curators. So I was a novelty. The fact that I wanted to be a curator, I had museum experience, I had research experience, and I understood how technology worked. And that made me, that was the gilding um, that got me my first museum job outside of New York at the Carnegie Museum of Art. I, I just have to interject with a technology curator note. When I started at the museum, well, when I was an intern, in 1999, they had just gotten email, yeah. like in 1998. And I would say 70% of the curators refused to use it. Exactly. It was like another four years or something. Ah, that's great. Oh, you're, you, that was Justin Rothschank. Is that your Wonder Woman mug? Yeah, I figured that I would honor uh, you and Justin. I feel like Wonder Woman today that you've honored me with this presentation. Oh, that's nice. Um, Okay, so you, you broadened your horizons past New York and that worked yes, out well. That worked out well. I mean, it put me 10 years in Pittsburgh and I would say that those were 10 years well spent. It also, in the middle of those 10 years, the five-year mark, the whole museum world collapsed. You know, um, this was around 2001 and um, between, um, between September 11th and the whole tech and how, you know, tech crash, um, every museum that was interviewing, you know, for that next level, that next leap, um, they had like a pit in the ground. They were all build it, build it and, and they'll come attitude, which was really bad, bad planning. Um, and uh, they were, it's like hiring freezes left and right. And it was, it was a terrible time. But at the same time, it just allowed me to just further pursue whatever I could do with the Carnegie. And, um, and I think it was, you know, it's important to be a junior cur curator somewhere to learn how the art of installation that again, a not, not practice. A, it's yeah. not something I remember my first time installing and Sarah Nichols, my mentor, like did everything she, I mean, like as a, as a Brit, you know, they have a, you know, she's very like locked down kind of like expressionless. I knew when she was hysterical and but I didn't know her that well my first few months and her lip was like vibrating because she was, it was just, I put everything on risers and everything at the back of the case and it was pretty funny. Um, and I had a lot to learn. Um, but, you know, I, I did attain that skill of installation and I did learn how to um, present things and I did learn how to present lectures and, um, and you know, it was an important moment. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're gonna get to New Grit in a, in a minute, but we'll do uh, your arrival at the PMA and um, you know diving into the, the work there and um, engaging. We did that, I got to, I'm so lucky that I got to work with you on the, um, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? The Enseca 2010 series. That was a wonderful play. opportunity. What was it called? I should be interactions. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, that was great. And then we um, started working on a, a show that has not yet happened, maybe years in the future, on a mid century craft and um, World War II and all of the other factors that were happening. And, and what a, a gift it was to be able to, to spend time with you and dive into that research and kind of um, learn from the artists who we got to interview and travel around. So that was. No, important. that was a great, it was a great experience. And, you know, like you were saying, start off this whole conversation that sometimes, you know, like my background in graduate work, you know, does, do I think about the history of the fork every day now? No, you know, does it not, does it serve me? No, no pun intended. Um, Absolutely. I mean, look at Doug's installation at the, the museum. That was from him hearing me talk about the history of dining as we traipsed through the museum, looking at metalwork from different centuries. You know, that, that's knowledge that will be always with me and, it, and it, it comes out to serve other projects. 
the world where, you know, looking at the, the founding of the studio craft movement um, is still with me, of course. Um, I feel like that, um, you know, as we plan the second floor galleries of American art, it's going to come into play there. Um, and, I, and my interest in like nomenclature and, you know, getting, like, for example, the Getty, any of you who know about the Getty and their other products, there's the Art and Architecture Thesaurus, for example. Any museum weenie knows about the Art and Architecture Thesaurus, and it's an important um, resource that allows museum curators to attach in the, the digital records, like what are the dates for French Impressionism? What are the dates for American Impressionism? You know, and, and people's like fought in rooms for months and months and months to decide canonically what those dates are. Well, I'm here to tell you the American studio craft movement does not exist in the AAT. And yeah. so my work, and I know this sounds very weeny and like, it's not something I'm ever gonna, like, I'm not gonna be publishing a book about it. You're not, I'm not gonna be going on Instagram. Look what I've done, you know? Like, it's not a celebratory star making moment, but about creating that canonical data is critical to this field. Otherwise, the rest of the world's gonna move on. It's never gonna tie to the canonical art historical mothership. And the whole movement would be just a, a bunch of us remembering it all. It, it, it's, it's digitally, it's critical that we do this work. And so that work that we did, Jen, is absolutely feeding into all this. So in a way it's manifesting itself in other truly more important things, not necessarily more important, I should, I should watch my words. It'll be foundational in order like that's the pebble that will constantly, or, or, or that I throw into the pond that will have a reverberation. A show is ephemeral. Mm -hmm. So I feel like um, that work will always serve in, in other forms. Yeah, absolutely. And then you're the, uh, the raising, carrying the banner of craft history is something that uh, you and I and many of our friends are doing and trying to get it to, um, as you're saying, become part of the canon of the general art history world is there's still work to be done. Absolutely. It's a it's, lot of work uh, to be done. We'll just keep talking about that too. That will, yes. That'll be another session. I see like <laughs> three or four people in here and that'll be, we'll have a group, we'll have a group lunch and learn about that. And we'll just all wring our hands about it. It'll be great. Um, so let's turn to new grit. I know people are excited to see images from that. So if you want to share, share your screen, screen and, um, Talk a little bit about, so this, this has been, I mean, not conceptually in the works because that's years and years, but in technically in the works, you started planning this show three years ago, maybe four years ago. Oh, it's about four years ago. And, um, oops. I, um, yeah, it's been about four years ago and we were a team of curators, uh, about seven of us when we first started, we've lost, we lost people along the way. Um, and it, I would say it's the, the, it's the thing, a thing, entity, the show, what I wanted to have happen at the museum now for, for 15 years. I, I, you know, Elmo greeted me 15 years ago this fall, okay? So it's, I'll be celebrating 15 years at the museum in October. And I would say when I finally got my, my bearings, um, the thing that I faced was sort of an isolation of the fact that craft was this, like it's sort of like being adopted by the Brady Bunch. You know, you have this large entity, this large museum, and now you have to wedge one more chair and table and fork, knife and spoon at the table, right? And so they weren't prepared for that, I think. And and um, and then like you know, contemporary craft. What what is this other thing, right? Well, now this show I think helped us sort of rethink what is contemporary art, at least by our definition at the museum, and to have people roll up their sleeves and work together. And I think. Um, the most important thing was um, learning how to talk with each other. It felt like in the beginning, and my colleagues would agree, it was like being at the UN with the translator turned off. We all spoke a different language, but there was a lot of respect for each other. Um, and so over a good two, you know, year and a half maybe period, we all brought our favorite artists and then we, we talked about them. Um, every single, like we'd have multiple meetings we started with over 200 artists and we whittled it down to what we thought was what could be the presentation. It's not to say that there aren't other important artists out there, 
But oh, yeah. we had to figure That's... out with all of our different practices, what were the ones that we could come together? And this is what we came up with. Um, so uh, there's a section called uh, Crossing Boundaries. I really am proud of this room, this presentation, this room. Um, you have Roberta Lugo with, um, uh, with Jesse Crimes and Wilmer Wilson IV. And, um, you know, Jesse, uh, excuse me, Roberto's work uh, is really uh, quite stunning. I mean, some of you know this work, of course. It was shown in, in uh, one of the, uh, the woodlands. Houses. Yeah, the woodlands. With um, past and, perfect. Yeah, and so it was uh, the pot on the left, which is, you know, do you know how to get a, a, a black man through high school? Um, and the one on the right is self portrait as street. And so the object on the right is, is very different than the one that was at the Woodlands. It's made of different material, um, but the, the pot on the left is the same, except he redacted his image on the back of it. Um, and I was I really, I thought, you know, how could I not put Roberto in this show? Um, he painted over the image on the back? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, he and redacted I it. Um, he, I think he, he told me that he felt he, he shouldn't have had his image with um michael you know, brown yeah. yeah with michael brown um oh. it, it didn't feel right and um so he redacted it and then decided to redo the, his effigy on the right the self-portrait of street um, which is about 500 pounds <laughs> um and quite precarious i mean you know i know in craft we pride ourselves on um you know it, it, it it's well made it's 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 highly it's not highly finished. It's it's very, you know, he, he it's almost an expression. It's very very much an expression of how he feels, and um, it's made in two pieces, and uh, it, it's very powerful. I hope I hope if you haven't come to see the show, I hope you'll come see it. Um, I think the fact that it's precarious. What you're saying is like he. This is how he feels. He he exactly. often talks about feeling uncomfortable in his own body, and yes. and the fact that it's not terribly stable and. It's sort of like, you know, the proportions are a little bit wonky and the, the, the fact that you look at it and you're like, oh, that's a little, looks like it's gonna fall. Like, I, I feel, I'm sure you've, you know, talked to Rob about this. No, he did, did it on purpose. That was his Yeah, intent. yeah. I mean, that, his goal, it, preciousness is not his goal. I mean, even, even the pot on the left, um, it has a hole at the bottom, which usually for a vase doesn't have, it usually has its, you know, foot, but there's a hole in the bottom and, it took us about two hours to place that object down on the floor. Now, many of you who are artists would probably laugh, like you would just come up and put it on the floor, but our floors were new. There was a lot of, uh, I call it afterbirth in the pot. So we were afraid that as it went down, the afterbirth would come out and would, as we moved it would scratch the floor and maybe hurt the object as well. So we put it up on birthing blocks and the two of us went in with our hand and removed the you know cut pieces of clay that fired and removed the afterbirth and the pieces the the, the blocks the birthing blocks if anyone knows what i'm talking about we we taped a whole bunch of, of blocks of wood together and we cut each level and we would lower it down by half inch and that took a good hour just to lower it down um it's very heavy it's about 300 pounds um and uh you know, it, I think Roberta would have gotten a kick of watching everyone try to put this together with our gloves on. And, you know, it's kind of how we are precious at the museum, right? So, um, but the, the thing that's important to say is also, I mean, this body of work was shown elsewhere, not too much before, sometime in, I think, 2019. And I just want to note that Elizabeth Esner, who's with us, was the curator for Graffiti and yes. at the Woodlands. Yeah. Yes. So thank you, Elizabeth, for bringing us this work. And I felt that even though it had been shown in Philly most recently, well, first of all, COVID just basically added five years onto everyone's time. So did anyone remember, you know, I mean, I'm sure they remember the installation, but it felt forever ago. But I thought also by bringing it to the museum, it would have a wider audience as well. And so it was kind of important. But what's, what's really nice is to pair it with someone like Jesse Crimes and making this sort of connection between two artists who, believe to their core that art saved their lives and that they're on a mission to help others, you know, introduce others to art in order to save them too. 
And yeah. so Jesse um, is a, a young man who was born and raised in Lancaster. Um, his story has to do with him winding up selling drugs and winding in, pr in, in prison. Um, he was in solitary for, for um, a year and he used art as a way to keep his mind, you know, not from losing it, uh, using materials that were available to him through the commissary. Um, and he created a body work out of his prison bed sheets and bars of soap and playing cards and newspaper and, and uh, periodicals. And he would um, mail them out to his friends, sort of like that's how he got his work out of the prison. Um, and then his, his grandmother sews and, and does um, repair. Um, and so she, he learned some sewing skills from her and also engaged the, the Amish quilting community, a bunch of Amish ladies in the quilting community um, near Lancaster to help him create a body of work based on the designs of other prisoners. And so that body of work was shown out in Lancaster in the barn. This body of work um, is about the prison population um, and it, it's um, Crow Hill on the left and Elegy on the right and Chair represents that forgotten population. And he also not only cuts up quilts that he finds, um, he also is including prisoners' uniforms, his own uniform. In fact, the orange slippers on in Crow Hill are from his uniform. Um, and the idea of that representation, instead of a portrait of someone that you see, it's, it's the portrait of who should be there and who's missing. Um, yeah. And you know, his work is, is quite beautiful. He's going on to make a whole other series where you cut into the quilt. So behind the quilting square is a picture, a quilted picture of, of the prisoner themselves. Um, and so, um, you know, to pair him with Jesse, I mean, with uh, Roberto um, in this installation, I thought it was extremely powerful. And then Wilmer Wilson, of course, uh, these sort of um, tarps that cover the, the signs on the highway um, are speaking. These were hung in Richmond uh, with the Confederate um, statue of Robert E. Lee and the idea of wanting to melt it down. Um, it's a very powerful gallery. And it was like really important in terms of our conversations with each other as curators to create these synergies. And like things were just like, once we understood each other, we understood our languages and we could also learn from our different languages. Like I feel like I've learned a whole new language um, to be able to th then be able to speak. It's like learning Esperanto, it became universal in the room between all of us in terms of those conversations to create this exhibition. Um, another uh, room, of, uh, another section of the show, Encounter and Exchange, where Bukali Velarde, who's, who's, on, um, who's in, the, in the house today, um, you know, it's, Bukuli is someone that uh, I have um, privately championed. I mean, she and I have talked about this, about she never knew how I felt about her work. Uh, I kind of kept my cards close. I saw her work for the first time in 2013 um, in Korea and was blown away by this series and privately and secretly committed that I would somehow bring this work to the public and through the museum somehow, some way. This was that opportunity and to be able to show five of her work from the Corpus series was really important. Um, it's the beating heart of the show. Yes, it, and yes, it is the beating heart of the show. And here is her newest uh, La Linda which was made during COVID and uh, it's reverential to her mother. And, you know, Corpus uh, is, is speaking to, um, you know, a, as a Peruvian and, and, and her culture about, you know, so sort of decolonizing what the Spaniards had done that way back in the day and taking it back, bringing it back, bringing back these deities, bringing back the influences, speaking about the people, making it look like having these, these saints look like people of Peru um and um and parading them down the center of the museum and I, at the center of this of this these new galleries you know where it's an honor to have her in in this space and then uh another um, and i'm showing you the artists that i that i sort of brought forward so uh, another artist that i definitely wanted to bring um into this exhibition this is the section called imagine worlds and we have three stained glass windows by judith schachter um, murdered animal on the left, Isola on the right, and um, over our dead bodies in the middle. Um, you know, uh, both murdered animal and Isola are from like 2018 and 2019. Uh, over our dead bodies was a work that she just showed us on uh, the computer, a computer generated des design that she was working on, and also some sketchings 
And many of you may follow her blogs or probably familiar with some of, you may have seen some of the designs for this two years ago, three years ago. When I visited her about two and a half years ago, I, like I said, I saw these sketches for this sort of patterned idea um, and it was gonna be a tree of life. Um, and Judith said, you know, like, I can't believe I'm doing a tree of life. I don't usually do religious subject matter. That's so not my bent. Um, but I don't know, something about the challenge of this work and this idea of these very patterned, um, almost like quilt squares, you know, um, sort of, uh, they're not, um, they're not regular. It's sort of an irregular pattern of colors uh, behind this tree. Um, and, you know, as January, February started to hit of 2020, she was starting to work on this. Come lockdown, like all of us in the spring of 2020, it was, the, I think we can all agree, it was the most beautiful season of spring we've ever seen. It's because we all weren't going anywhere. We were actually watching the blades of grass. We were watching the birds come back. And also there were so many people starting to die around us. Let's be, let's be honest that, that um, those two opposing forces of, of life and spring and you know, signs of life and the fact that COVID was really hitting hard all, everywhere um, was pretty tough. And I think Judith, you know, like everyone would take those walks, you know, when you could outside and she hates nature. She'll be the first one to tell you she hates nature. Uh, but the birds and the, the critters in this stained glass are, you know, out of her own imagination. And, and she went wild. She really took it to a different level. Um, but she realized, and one day she called me up and she said, I know I told you that, that it would be this dimension, you know, we had gotten a dimension so we could plan the design. Um, that's what we do way in advance. And she said, I'm so, so sorry, it's going to be bigger. And I said, I'm sure it won't be a problem, but what, what's, what do you mean it's going to be bigger? She said, yeah, I realized that you can't have life without having death. And, and aren't we all experiencing that right now? So she created a cemetery on the lower level. Um, which expanded it by like six or seven inches. And um, I really feel that this work, I mean, there's some other really important works that she has made over the past 10 years, but this work is, is a pivot for her. It, it changes a lot of, of, she even says it herself, it was the most challenging work she's made to date. Um, she was really concerned it wouldn't come out well, which meant to anyone who knows her that it was gonna be fantastic. Um, and I really do believe it's a chronicle of what we all went through. Like as, an, as a work of art, one could point to it and really it explains a lot of, of what we were all experiencing. Um, and art is that, right, Jen? It's a chronicle. Yeah, um, and it's, it is. Well, it, it there's gonna be a moment in a few, right? Um, right? In a few years, we're gonna be able to, to use these objects to remember you know, and maybe in a hundred years when people are, we aren't here anymore, to, yeah. they'll be able to assemble these objects that were made about COVID just about like any other world disaster. And, and we'll be, it's that, it's the empathy in the other direction. Instead of us trying to figure out what people were thinking, we're sort of sharing that idea with, with the future. Also in this gallery is Hiro Sakaguchi. So whereas Judith is like the imagination is in from her own experience, her own mind, you know, here also is bringing in his experience of being born in Japan and living in the States and, and traversing those two worlds. Um, his, his world is, uh, is very twee, you know, lots of toys and pastel colors, you know, it feels like cotton candy, but like Judith is apocalyptic <laughs> um, and is speaking to war and like what's happening in nature and the environment and, and, um, but he's using like the toys of his youth and that wistful uh, memory of what playing, you know, GI Joe or um, playing with matchbox cars or whatever, like all these things in airplanes, but yet the airplane is going into, a, you know, the ground or, you know, like in this case, uh, the, the object that you see the debris, you know, it's, it's, it's pulling up from the ground, all these toys and everything, like as if it's, at first you just don't know what it is until you see that plane, you know? Um, and um, but again, like his, his, palette is is it reminds me of cotton candy you know the idea of candy floss um and hero like for me i i've definitely brought hero forward although not from a craft practice uh, again like here was a moment where we all kind of swapped and became one type of curator we all 
championed work that we may not have been allowed to, you know, in terms of our what our um, what kingdom we're in charge of or what silo, you know, the fact that we could break down silos, Jen, was the most important thing. Um, it's something, you know, for, for me, and I think my colleagues would agree, it's something I've been pushing for for at least 12 years at the museum, like the idea of putting contemporary art on one platform. This has been my, my dream, my wish. Yeah. Um, for well, them, maybe they weren't, maybe for them, they weren't considering that because it, there was nothing wrong, right? For us, there was something wrong. Right. And so I feel um, that, you know, this show allows us to present with one platform. And, and then the, the other artist, um, and I'll come back to that point in a second. Uh, the last gallery that uh, I have an artist in is Inside Out is the name of the gallery. And it's, um, I commissioned, there were four commissions for the show. And one of them was an artist I championed, Doug Bucci. And this is called The Last Course. Um, and Doug basically is a metalsmith. He works in CAD, he's a jeweler, um, but he expanded his practice to think about dining and dining history and an object that we don't ever see very much anymore called a pern. And then a pern is an object that is usually appears in the second and third courses and in the third course of a 18th century dining banquet for a very elite class uh, would have dessert, which is like as a diabetic that Doug is, uh, is would be the death of him. Um, and so he created this tableau where he in, in CAD designed this entire space and 3D printed practically everything um, or had the design then in form, like for example, the moat table. Um, and basically he, there are some pieces of jewelry here and there, but mainly it's the whole room is the work of art. And he is speaking to his experience as a diabetic of what it's like to wake up every morning and know till you go to bed at night what you cannot have and if you choose to eat those things and consume and it's about consumption and indulgence which is what dining in the 18th century and and before was about it was about showing your wealth showing that you can consume whatever you want as much as you want um and so uh, for him he's talking about consequence of that indulgence um and it's about morbidity and death and um you know, I, I'm, Doug has been thinking about this installation for 10 years, and I had always hoped that he would have been supported by other, you know, awarding institutions and situations. And when this opportunity came, I knew it had to be me. It had to be me in the museum to bring this presentation forward. Um, so I'm really proud. I'm, I, I'm proud of him. Um, and I don't mean that in a maternal sense, like something like this takes a long time to think through. And any artist who's out there can agree. Sometimes you get off, off the path, right? And it was a wonderful interaction between he and I over these years. So just like, just to be that person, not knowing I'd be bringing it forward, just to be that person that he could throw the spaghetti against the wall. And like, I would say, no, you know, that's not gonna fly. You're off, you're off the path, you've strayed, you know, oh my God, that's great. You know, let's, you should push that further. You know, that kind of like conversation, almost like your guidance counselor. Um, <laughs> But to then be able to be the one to bring it forward um, pleased me to no end. So, um, so that's new grit. But I think like back to the point about sil you know, silos and I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, I think what the most interesting thing about this exhibition, at least for me, once it was installed, once we got to see the real thing and, the, and keep in mind everybody, um, we have never been in these galleries before. We were installing through our imagination and a dollhouse we created. So we had no idea, like what we would look through the little dollhouse hole and see Doug's installation on the long, you know, long enfilade, you know, like, and we knew it was going to look great, but we had no idea until we installed it, what it was going to be like. We would look in the peak holes to see what would Kukuli's work look like down that runway. And then to convince Kukuli that we knew that if we installed it this way, it would be the way to do it, you know, and like we, the artists had to trust us and some of them had never worked with museum folk before or or maybe have worked too much with museums and like really had knew what they wanted and I appreciate that but but our art the art that we do is the art of installation and how things work in a room and in space and um and once it was all put together and before anyone got to see it I mean of course we were very puffed up and pleased with ourselves but the most important part 
was that when you look at all the artwork, all of it, not just the things I've shared with you today, not the things that I privilege or the camp I come from, it looks to me as if contemporary art, like we've always wanted to be contemporary art or maybe we were striving to be contemporary or maybe we didn't care. I don't know, there's a lot of people out there there's an opinion that we shouldn't care about that. We shouldn't worry about privileging ourselves as such. But to me, it looks like contemporary art has swung towards craft. It is, there is so much hand in this show. There is so much materiality in this show. And I know there are a few other shows out there at other major cities and museums. If you look really hard, uh, Contemporary art is craft. And like, I, I, I don't know, it just was amazing. That epiphany was like, I felt so pleased with myself. I have to be honest, just to have that notion and to keep talking about it. I feel, and my colleagues actually don't disagree. I think they understand now because they've been with me now for three and a half years. And you know, I've been pummeling them with what they have to understand, what they have to know and sharing my language with them. And then they, you know, meeting our artists, talking with our artists. And I think like that, that's the work that has to be done. We can have a fit or say it as much as we want, but it's about collaboration that is going to change the conversation. And um, that's a lot of work, but it's important work. That's the, the most important thing I could possibly say today about the show. And that's why I, anytime I talk about the show, to anyone I say it's a landmark exhibition because it is really the first time that there's a show of contemporary art in Philadelphia and there are no distinctions there's photography video painting sculpture material craft everything it's it's on a level playing field and so I just congratulations again it's well thank you for that it's really important and it will I believe it is throwing a pebble in the water it's going to have repercussions and um the bar is now set to accept at least you know in at the museum hopefully it continues to be that way and you know when you were talking about different categories in museums when we go up to the fourth floor at the clay studio and we talk to the resident artists they are not they're not even just working with clay. They're working with all different things. The clay is their main medium, but they do other things. They think of in the same, they're, they went to art school. They're doing the same things everybody else is doing. They don't have these distinctions. And even, you know, artists who aren't using craft material don't, aren't necessarily looking down their noses. It's, it really is, um, it's, it's a holdover from in the institutions and it has to do with the marketplace and, and, we just have to keep supporting that the artists don't care and those looking at it don't care. And that's gonna now continue to bubble in the right direction. So thank you for doing that. So important. Um, I hope that people have questions. There are so many great objects that Elizabeth showed. I, if you haven't gone to see the show, this is only like one eighth of the things in the show, right, Elizabeth? How many, right. like 47, I don't know. I just made that up. How many works are in the show? Well, there are 25. 24 artists, 25th was a dance performance. Um, I, I lost, I have to be honest, you know, we we knew what objects were coming in and then certain art, artists showed up with more <laughs> as they were installed. So I have no, I, I've lost count of how many actual objects were in the show, um, to be honest. Well, and the another thing that really rung true with me was this idea of um, designing an exhibition in an imaginary space. And I saw my Anna and Elizabeth and Raymond all nodding <laughs> because, uh, Anna made us a beautiful model that Raymond helped her with. And we're just, you know, we've got our little doll like people and we have no idea what the Making Place Matter show is gonna look like on the wall. Cause literally the same thing, the walls don't exist yet. There is no yeah. gallery. Um, so it is an extra challenge, a welcome one for sure to have new galleries and then for us a new building. Um, oh, Raymond's showing, can you see the um, I don't know if you put yourself, who's looking at this way. Pin him. Let me pin him, there he is. Oh, it's blurry, Raymond. Oh, because you have your background blurred. <laughs> anyway, we get the picture. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, so does anyone have any questions? You're either welcome to put it in the chat um, or just take yourself off mute. 
Diana says the show is superb. She's visited twice and will go again. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. The, the um, I have a question, comment. Sure. Um, I've I've been to the, the show three times. Nice. I'm loving it. I bring everybody who comes into town. So. Oh wait, Julia, Thank do you, you want to introduce yourself first? Yeah. Um, my name is Julia. Um, I know the Clay Studio. I've done the Small Favor show twice now. Okay. Um, I just graduated from Tyler in the metals department, um, and I'm now. Um, I'm at Penn right now, actually starting in the fall, but I'm working in the studio for the summer. Okay. Um, so, nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you too. Um, I a lot of the work that I did um, in undergrad was like very like technology art crossover. Um, like everything that Doug is interested in is like what I'm interested in, and he was like really inspiring for me. Um, and it was really cool to like hear you talk about like how technology was like starting to become like integrated um, into the art world like when you were starting out and I'm just like wondering where you where you maybe see that going in the future. That's a good question and I would I should I should clarify you know technology for me was not making at that point it was like the idea of digi digitizing images. Yeah. Getty was the leader on this thing and it was about the, the size of what, what is a digital image and like what makes, a, what's a pixel and it was very, right. very <laughs> primitive. You know, like Jen mentioned, the idea of having email. Like I remember when, and this is this is technology too, I'm gonna share with you, it's gonna blow your mind. When they brought the fax machine into the American art offices <laughs> at the Metropolitan Museum in 1991. And no one knew, everyone stood around it like, what is it, what does it do? I don't know, you know, like I knew what it was because as the secretary, I was responsible for figuring out how that worked. And when the first fax came in from London, it was like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. And then the crazier part was then two days later, the curator called to find out why we hadn't responded. And I looked at the machine and I said, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> because that meant that now people wanted it resto you know so technology could be many different things here so in terms of like in terms of information sharing and in, in terms of like what we've all been through technology was amazing the idea of having sharepoint and being able to work virtually with each other um and share documents um to be able to be invited on jen's platform to speak you know, some certain certain institutions couldn't pivot fast enough, and that fact that smaller institutions could adopt some tech, you know, interesting technologies and incorporate it. In terms of the art world, though, if you're speaking with art specific specificity, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I guess just like I, when I was applying for programs um, for graduate school, I was having a lot of trouble because like I'm I'm interested in in like I was saying, like everything Doug does, like the science and the technology and that crossover between like fine art and those things. Yeah. Um, I was like having a lot of trouble finding programs that okay, would so, like accept so, Doug's a, so Tyler is very unique because of Stanley and because of Doug and people like Doug. You have, uh, uh, is it, um, oh, I'm getting his first name, Matthew Hollerand, right? Who's, who teaches out in the Midwest in Cleveland. And then, um, there are a few others as well, um, but in terms of metal smithing, but like there are other programs maybe aren't as forward thinking. I mean, MIT has an incredible, um, you know, the idea of using science and technology and art. Um, and I think there are artists that are incorporating it into their practice, but I don't see it like as like everyone just appropriating it and adopting it and moving forward with it. I think there's always going to be traditional, if I can call it traditional making. You've been trained by like a, a school and a person that is ahead of his time, you know? Um, and so I, maybe we could talk off, off channel here about <laughs> other ideas, but I mean, that's my initial response. Yeah, I'm always just curious to hear like what, what where people anticipate it going in the future. So I mean, as I an like art museum, we, we need to figure that we need to incorporate these things and we are open to these things. And if it's like a digital file, like I mean, there's some artists that the work is on a file, like, and we're gonna have to, other museums are way more ahead of, of, of us in the sense of how you store that data as equipment dies off, right? So that's a problem. Um, 
So yeah, what we can talk. Yeah. I mean, there's <laughs> the whole non-fungible token yes, situation happening now, but I, what I, I'll just answer my, my hope is that we're now past the point of, um, uh, that initial excitement where anyone who uses CAD to make jewelry is just like, you know, in the very early years, you were just trying to figure out what was happening and like how to use it. And it's, a, it's matured to the point where you can really use it as the tool for what, if it's the right application for what you want to do, as opposed to just like, oh my gosh, I have this cool thing that I can use now. And I, I liken it to the late 19th century or the mid 19th century when people were going crazy because things were mechanized and you could have um, chromolithography create color plates in your books and you could have it printing on fabric and you could add lots of decoration because it was easy in the, in the machines and I feel like that there was some you could liken that same idea that in the beginning it was like oh this is cool thing we can do and now you have the benefit of the, that's behind you right and now you can say like all right well which part of my art do I want to use this for that it's most appropriate and like which part do I the more appropriate thing is something handmade and accepting it all mixing together and that that's my hope and kind of vision for for how it's gonna move forward yeah I know we're getting towards we're sort of over our time but I just want to go to the chat and see I think there might be a few other questions Jennifer Martin wrote um this might be good for you um Julia look in the chat she said the National Endowment for the Arts recently announced the release of the report tech as art supporting artists who use technology as a creative medium so do check that out um, and Diana wrote, David Hackney was excited by every shift forward in technology and has used it to make artwork. Yeah, and that's in all fields. Uh, Raymond put a link, interestingly enough, to Wayne, um, which I guess is, is that Wayne State, and that's where Stanley Lexon went to undergrad. So they've been they've been exposed to this since the '60s for sure. Um, and Leslie's giving us a compliment. Um, thank you, Leslie. Continue to influence as museums are regularly inviting artists to reflect and interpret works in the permanent collection and architectural spaces. Yeah, that was a really special moment. Thank you for all the nice words, everyone. Anyone, are there any final questions or, or comments before? Jennifer Scanlon's got her hand up. I did have a question for Yay. you. But, um, and it's great to see you guys. Yay, technology in this Hi, sense guys. that um, from Oklahoma, I can uh, connect with. Though I can't go see the show, it's killing me now. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to ask, having uh, since you started uh, the conversation a little bit with the idea of the, um, the mid-century studio craft, which was a show I, I was able to work on in New York, um, oh, of course. Yeah. And I'm wondering if having been through this period, having done this amazing show, which um, stretches out beyond categories and having been through the past year, which in addition to sort of isolation also brought us a new series of voices that made us all really look and I know a lot of us were already looking at how expansive our look at art history has been mm. whether you would do that show differently whether this mm. craft movement is worthwhile to look at as a separate um, as a separate category of art. You've just mentioned how not having those categories was really freeing. Whether we are the canon is what it should be, or should it be expanded? Mm. Should we only look at academic? Should we expand beyond that? So that's mm. a question for you. Would you do that show differently? Having yes. been through the past year? Yes, and I would. Great. And I would say that as much as I mourned the fact that I couldn't at that time. The only thing that kept me rooted was that it's, it's, it's the mantra that some of you who know me well know, things happen for a reason and they happen when they're supposed to. And looking back now, and I think Jen would agree, as much as we wanted that show to happen back in that time, it would not be, it would not be the thing. We should not have, it would not have, like, it'd be completely different. It would be totally put on its side. How could it not be? with how, what we know, how we know, how we think now. And also the fact that like, I mean, it, it's been very interesting, you know, when you think about um, the fact that we need to diversify as well. And there are a whole bunch, there are whole schools of even making within our craft sector that we have 
we're not even tapped into. We have no idea because we, it, the, the presentation of, um, of all men, all white, like, <laughs> you know, even just that, like we could spend a whole hour just talking about that. And, um, and I feel also in terms of then like going even further afield, like this idea of what is craft or what is the studio craft movement as a movement and like, um, I mean, when I speak canonic canonically, I'm speaking very, and, and like, this is not the hour to, like we're end, at the end of our time, but, um, you know, for the sake of like using the museum system and being able to take an object like, um, oh God, there's so many to choose from, but, you know, a, a ceramic object, Karen Carnes, like how, you know, she was part of the American Studio Craft Movement. Like we should tie her to that as a movement. There's a movement field, right? There's that, right? There's that work. But then like thinking about what is American Studio Craft and like all the things you're referencing. Yes, I, my answer is like globally, yes. And, um, and like, I would love to be able to talk about that with practitioners, right? We should be having that conversation. But the question is where? Where do we have that conversation, ladies and gentlemen? Like, you know, on a, on a thing like this publicly? No, like we need to have a moment where we come together and talk about these things. And I don't see maybe unless there's only one organization that might privilege that conversation to help bring us together, but I don't see that happen. Like I would like to do that conversation. And you know, those of you who know me, you know, I went to Haystack, I gave a, a keynote about this, just about this. This is not work that we're ever gonna win an award for or, or get a, a prize from AAMC or like, I'm, none of that is important to me. You know, the work is doing it right and setting down and codifying it so that when future historians come along, they have some substrate, some substructure in which to change and, and mutate as they add on to the conversation or our research. And um, I am very passionate about this subject. I mean, the article, my, my, my talk was published in Haystack's monograph, if you really wanna know what I think. Um, I was very Elizabeth Agro in what I wrote down and how I put my footnotes, you'll have fun reading it. Um, but like this, if you wanna do real work, this is the work that needs to be done. And Jennifer, thank you for asking that question. Because like truly, I mean, I love this show. And yes, it gives me a moment to like feel like a rock star. Thank you, Jen Zwilling, for bringing me forward. Seriously, I really am truly touched. But the heart of what I want to do, what the legacy that I want to leave is that work. That is critical. So I'll leave you with a very rah-rah. <laughs> Am I crazy, Jen Scown? I think I was going to say, Jen, how would you answer that question since you did you did that show right. so beautifully and it was important. And I just have yes. to say, we needed to have that show when we when it was. Well, but yes. What's your right. answer? Right now, I'm looking at that show as an opportunity to see what we could do better. Right. I'm looking right. At the show is like having set down some ground rules that now everybody can. Uh, rebel against <laughs> like point out and find the mistakes and find the gaps and um and you know expand it and strengthen it and and do better um because, i have some thoughts know, about have conversations so they're like we should, ah, we why do we do that <laughs> well and the and and how generous of you to uh, you know allow that conversation because sometimes having something to sort of think about and, and understand what needs to be done differently. And I won't say better because it's everything happens in its moment. Sure, um, yeah. That's that's a really generous thing to do. I'm putting a link to this show in so people know what we're talking about. Um, and yeah, I don't think we have as craft curators and uh, it's a, we, we have to have distinctions because we can't be experts on everything. It's a matter of having the distinction and then being able to work together on a level playing field. But those of us who are craft curators know that there's really no, as Elizabeth said, place for us. And we just, we, we need to keep making these opportunities together. But I think now is our, the end of our time today, but I think I now know what a future Lunch and Learn is gonna be with uh, Elizabeth Agro and Jennifer Scanlon and a few other people. And uh, I wanna say thank you to everyone for coming. Oh, Raymond put the haystack thing in the chat too, thank you. Oh, thanks. I really enjoyed <laughs> our time today. I, I always enjoy spending time with uh, my friend Elizabeth, and I am honored that you agreed to join us today. So thank you back right back to you. And have a great day, everybody. See you next week with your moments of joy. Great to see you, Jen Scanlon and Elizabeth yeah, and all so my thanks friends. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I know everyone's so busy. Thank I miss you. you. <laughs> I miss you too. Bye, everybody.